All right. I believe we're live. <laughs> Hello, fellow investors. I'm Jake, and alongside me, our friend with 209,000 YouTube subscribers, Daniel Pronk. <laughs> Welcome to Stock Talk, brought to you by Stock Unlock. We're two stock enthusiasts stationed from New York and Calgary, Canada, united by our love for dissecting stocks in the market. As proud co-founders of Stock Unlock, we're guiding thousands on their investing journey across the globe. This is not just another podcast. It's a thrilling expedition into the financial unknown, streaming live on YouTube. Yes, that is right now. And reaching your ears via Spotify and Apple Music. Today, we're turning our analytical lens towards the semiconductor hype around NVIDIA, assessing if CVS is as bargain priced as it seems. We're going to talk about Canadian banks, and we'll be analyzing our favorite your stocks live if you made it here for the live stream. So buckle up. You're tuned into episode number 34 of Stock Talk. And that was generated by AI. Thank you, ChatGPT. I'm not sold. It's number 33. It's not 34. <laughs> what are you doing, ChatGPT? Come on. That was a user input error, so I'll take. <laughs> Jake letting me down. Yeah. Well, it was cool up until the end. How, how are you doing up there, Daniel? I'm doing all right. I got, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. Well, we got a wow, great intro from Sophie, Ralph Staccato, Jonathan. Great to see you all this morning. Always love seeing you all in the chat. Thank you for joining us. If you're watching the recording, come join us live sometime. Daniel, no shortage of excitement in the market this morning. I have a quiz for you. What was the most talked about stock? What was the most talked about stock? Oh, man, I think Ford. Ford. I was gonna say Nvidia. I was gonna say Nvidia, but Ford did strike that deal with Tesla, right? I actually have no idea. I was just trying to pick a stock, but no, it's definitely Nvidia. Everyone's talking about Nvidia. Everyone's talking about AI. A little bit bubbly to me. I I agree. The so, anyways, you did guess right on Ford. So Tesla has a bunch of Tesla branded charging stations. But Ford vehicles in the future will be able to use Tesla's charging stations. Elon Musk also made it very clear their intention with the charging stations is not to be a walled garden Tesla specific thing. They're very open to. And I'm sure that they're getting some revenue profit kick from this to partner with other car companies. And Ford was on that list. So, yep. you know, of course, that got a lot of people excited just from a business standpoint. I love that decision from Elon uh, to go towards green energy and all that stuff. Yeah, no, it's good. I'm, I'm glad they're sharing the network and I imagine they will be generating some profits off doing so. Definitely. So from Rob H here, great to see you again. What's everyone's vote bubble or not? I'm going to assume that you're talking about the semiconductor stocks and I thought it would be funny. I'm going to share my screen here, Daniel, to lead off with a little bit of Jim Cramer fun, not to throw this guy too much uh, shame, but I believe he said that he was going to start shorting the video at, 240 ish well oh 130 so here we go daniel nvidia is a loser i mean what's funny is on my channel i said that nvidia was expensive around like 120 140 dollars and that i wasn't buying it i mean that doesn't mean i need to short it or anything it was just like i don't want to position it at this price and then you know, now it's near four hundred dollars. It's almost tripled since then. So I got some. I got some people on my YouTube channel over the weekend, or sorry, not over the week. It's the weekend now, but over the week they were like, Daniel was saying it was expensive at one forty, and now it's at three eighty. It's like, yeah, it happens. <laughs> I, I don't know what's gonna happen in the market, so all I can do is give you my opinion. Yeah, and it's important to call out, too, that you did not make or lose zero dollars on that. So you never really lose money by sitting on the sidelines. But yeah, you yeah, can't right. argue with it. NVIDIA stock has ran to the moon. There's a lot of AI hype. I will actually say some of it's real. But of course, as we always do, we need to tie it back to a stock fundamentals and valuations, which it seems like yeah. people are really pricing that in. Yeah, no, I agree. AI, I think, is definitely real. I think it's going to change the world. But at the same time, people are pricing that in already. I mean, NVIDIA is at like 35 times sales now. It's at 200 times cash flow. It's just, if you go to the DCF, I've done this on Twitter, but if you do a reverse DCF, the stock is pricing in something like 45% cash flow growth annually for the next five years. And it's got to trade at a 60 price to free cash flow just to be worth fair value today. 
Like that's how much growth is already priced into it at this price. So even if it does execute and grow well over the next five years, it's like you'll get, you'll maybe get market returns. Yeah. So I, yeah, I thought this was interesting too, Daniel. So let's just look at a few of the most popular semiconductor stocks. And someone's asking, are we in a bubble? I don't know. Um, that's always very hard to call, to call in the moment, but there is a ton of hype around these stocks. It seems like everyone and their mother, father, grandparents are talking about it. And while I'm flipping through all these here, Daniel, as you can kind of see, all right, I lost the price graph on this one, but you can kind of see across all these stocks, a pretty similar price action move where they're yeah. all moving up together. So one interesting thing also about NVIDIA is I was reading that they just filed for a $10 billion shelf offering, which is $10 billion of dilution. So what's interesting to me is NVIDIA basically comes out and says, hey, we're going to increase our revenue by 50% next quarter. The stock goes nuts. Everyone's super happy. And then while the stock is up, they dilute people, which is it's fair game. You know, it's it's not illegal. But what what I'm definitely going to be watching for now is does NVIDIA hit 50% growth next quarter? Because if they come in now and they're like, oh, we grew revenue by even 25% and the stock goes down, then it's like, did they say that they were going to, you know, increase revenue by 50% just to boost the stock up even more and then dilute? Like, I don't know. So we'll see. You know, some of the uh, best capital allocators in the world, according to the investor greats, know when to buy back shares versus do a share offering. And if your stock is priced incredibly high, it could actually be smart to do a share offering. But yep, credit to what you're saying, Daniel, I, I actually agree. It looks like this stock is priced to perfection right now. If I was sitting on the videos board, I think it might be smart to sell some shares at this price, capitalize the business even more. They're obviously able to use that to build out more infrastructure for generating more and more of these AI chips. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, when Tesla was up around like $1,000 a share, I don't know if that was pre-split or not, but I remember they were doing quite a bit of dilution up there and I actually agreed. I thought, I thought it was so expensive that they should have been doing dilution. When your stock is overvalued, it actually does make sense to do some dilution. And yeah, I believe someone please fact check me on this, but I believe that Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, they did one deal where they offered stock of Berkshire Hathaway in the deal. And the reason was because Buffett thought the stock was pretty overvalued at the time. So by offering stock, he was like, I think that the stock one to one for a dollar is actually very expensive. So rather than buying this business in cash, it actually makes sense right now to issue some stock and buy it that way. So yeah, I mean, as you said, the great capital allocators think about their stock like that. They're definitely paying attention to the value of their business versus the stock price and trying to capitalize on that the best way they can. Yeah. And this graphic right here too really shows, at least judging from a price to free cash flow valuation metric, how expensive this stock has gotten relative to its cash flows. Now, yes, it will grow into some of these, but again, as value investors, this is not a buy or sell recommendation. We are not financial advisors, but really not that much meat on the bone here. I mean, I'm seeing this peak up to 250 price free cash flow, which is pretty monstrous right now. And it just seems to be running. Historically, we see that this can't go on forever, but this is an interesting story. I think, Daniel, I mean, AI is real. They are selling a yep. lot of chips. I think it's a lot different than crypto. There's actually real value being created here. I think the big question marks for me are how much are you going to be able to capitalize on this and in what time frame? Because Microsoft, Apple, these big tech companies are already announcing that they're going to start to make their own chips or continue to, to reduce dependency on these companies. And as technology advances, this is just me putting on a tinfoil hat. I really don't know, but it doesn't seem super far-fetched to me that there will be technological advancements in computing, uh, creating this stuff where the cost of it goes down over time and it becomes easier for competitors to come in. I understand that is not the case today, but when I buy a stock, I try to look five or 10 years out. And it's really hard for me to feel confident on understanding where this company will be in five or 10 years, just based on how fast technology is moving today. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, well, I didn't have anything else. Any other comments on these, uh, dare I say, hype stocks, Daniel? And if anyone bought before and is up big, seriously, congratulations. We get happy whenever anyone makes money and we never really cheer for things to go down. Yeah. The way I put it on my channel was, I'm happy for everyone who's making money, but I'm not envious. 
because if you're like if you start to feel envious of others which is basically a form of jealousy of others returns then it can cause you to chase those returns or like if i felt envious i would feel like i need to be in nvidia stock at the highs right now which is pretty risky in my opinion so i'm definitely happy for everyone who's making money that's a good thing but as an investor try not to be envious of it and uh don't let it don't let it guide your actions yeah and for people looking to invest and uh, ride any of the hype in the waves of ai please do so responsibly you know make sure that you're looking at the company's fundamentals that you understand who their competitors are and there yes there is definitely a lot of money to be made in this space and by you know just be safe out there i'm seeing yes. a lot of people kind of run to these stocks that don't invest they're like oh i'm gonna go buy some shares of nvidia i'm seeing so many articles about it and i'm like i'm not an advisor so i won't tell you not to just please understand what you're buying and the valuation of it and how all those things matriculate down into returns over time so so you let's can go learn from, that on stock unlock so Perfect let's go price. from talking about the most exciting stocks in the market right now to the most boring stock <laughs> you want to lead cvs jake sure yeah so we had someone bring up cvs to us daniel i was actually going to ask you because we were talking about this a bit before the stream is cvs up in canada and no. do you have any thoughts on cvs or is this just kind of a mystery us company to you i have the slightest idea of what the company does but i have never interacted with them personally and when i think about this business i get bored which could be a good thing you know it means that people are probably not looking at it i'm not yeah well in terms of its price to free cash flow it is trading at its lowest price to free cash flow almost ever there you it's go free cash flow yield right now is actually 20 percent however there seems to be a little bit more than meets the eye here just a disclaimer for everyone watching this i have not really done a huge deep dive on cvs's business this is not a complete analysis by any means but what we will be doing is going through their financial statements and having some light conversations about what their valuation is today there's definitely homework for you to do here in the chat or if you're listening to the recording if you were to come to the personal decision to buy or sell this stock so yeah, this is CVS. They're basically a pharmacy, at least in New York City where I live. There is literally a CVS every few blocks. This is a place where people go to not really like do food shopping, but to get random essentials. You can think of kind of like a subset of Target. They also have a pharmacy. So what I think is happening here, Daniel, is Mark Cuban, Mark Cuban's drug company, as well as many other you know, digital delivery services for getting drugs is really starting to pinch in my opinion cvs's moat because for a while you actually had to go physically in the pharmacy covid hyper accelerated getting medicine digitally and started advancing a lot of the you know like laws and legality things around how that could be done so let's take a quick look at their insight score in stock unlock so you can see that analysts love it uh, they do pay a dividend the dividend is well covered and i think the yield is around three and a half percent right now which is really not that bad uh, their financial health, as we can see, is not that great. One thing I noticed is they have a lot of debt, Daniel, which I do want to look at. And they have a lot of intangible assets. So while it looks like they do have a lot of assets, if you look at their tangible book value, it is negative. And that subtracts the goodwill and other phonies from the assets. So I thought that was interesting. This is also a business that's not growing a ton. Uh, they are growing top line decently, but their other profitability metrics, or sorry, growth rate metrics are kind of meh. And it's the same thing for profitability. Their margins are pretty slim. Their gross is all right, but it, they're usually really treading on profitability, at least by a net income level and average returns. So not sure if anything uh, caught your eye there, Daniel. But... Uh, the thing that catches my eye is just that 20% free cash flow yield. I mean, when you got, that. I mean, when you got a 20% free cash flow yield, the business basically doesn't need to grow anymore at that price. Because even if the business doesn't grow, it could deliver you back 20%. Like if they wanted to pay a 100% of the free cash flow right now as a dividend, you'd be getting a 20% annual dividend. So, I mean, whenever a stock is, you know, around that 10 to 20 or above a 10% free cash flow yield, I should say, it immediately starts to become interesting to me because again, the business can basically give you that 10% return without needing to even grow the business anymore. And if you actually take a look at Warren Buffett's recent buys in Q1, um, they were buying HPQ, 
and I believe it was Citigroup. And these two businesses haven't really grown that much over the past decade. But I mean, the Berkshire portfolio still has them and is adding to them. And the reason is, in my opinion, because they have 13% earnings and free cash flow yields, and they're buying back shares and paying dividends to shareholders with that money. So then the question just becomes, do you think that they can continue doing that over the long term? And if the answer is yes, then it's like, okay, well, then you're probably going to get that 13% return to you. So CVS looks kind of like the same story. It definitely could be. So what we're looking at here, just to back up what you're saying, and plus one to all of that is this is the price of free cash flow for CVS. It is trading at a price of free cash flow below five. And Daniel, just to make this a little interactive, look at the low over this, yep. let's call it 15 year period and look at the latest. This is the there lowest price to free cash flow CVS has been trading at in the past 15 years. And if we even zoom this up even more, it looks like it was steadily trading around 14 ish uh, in back in 2010 era. Yeah, so, and it just keeps going down. So if I was seriously going to look at the stock, um, I would just try and figure out why that is. Like whenever a stock is trading at an all time low, valuation in terms of its cash flows or earnings or whatever i typically find that there's a reason so maybe the business is going through something you know maybe maybe they got some competition coming maybe their margins are going down i have no idea maybe that outlook looks pretty bad but i would just want to try and figure out why it's why it's selling like it is right now so i see a few things and what's interesting is their revenue and top line is constantly going up you can see that their expenses do go up with revenue so they're not making a ton more money off of that i'd say one of the most yeah, interesting is... things i saw was on their balance sheet because this company is carrying a decent amount of debt right now yeah this is like your typical consumer staple company it probably has negative tangible book value it does has a lot of debt is generating cash flow though like yeah this is it's also just a retailer so retailers in general seem to have pretty thin margins definitely okay, yeah they have at... over 17 billion of cash uh over 55 billion in long-term debt i'll bring up the margins for you here yeah like if you look at costco even i mean i think costco has a gross margin of under five percent yeah if you want to take a look make sure i'm my memory is correct here but i think their free cash flow margin is like three percent or something Oh, they are trading at a much higher multiple. Wow. Yeah. That's like Costco, not terrible. Costco is a, an amazing business. I would love to own this, but I simply cannot buy it at these prices. It just doesn't come down and I'm not going to buy it at, at the prices that it's trading for. So I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do about that one. Just keep it on my watch list. Hopefully they go through some sort of short term event where people don't like the business for some reason. But <laughs> yeah, take no, take a look at their free cash flow margin. Gotcha. Yeah. I always like to look at this one where it's like, oh, it looked expensive. But it's like if oh, you yeah. bought Costco back here, your free cash flow yield on cost is actually still kind of high. Um, anyways, yeah. what was that metric you wanted, Daniel? Uh, free cash flow margins. And if anyone is curious what we're using here, this is the stock unlock freeform tool. It is, of course, free to come on our site, try all this out. Anyways, back to you, Daniel. Uh, yeah. So you can see what is CVS is right now latest is five percent yeah look at costco's free cash flow margin is only 2.3 percent and this is like one of the one of the best businesses in the world probably and uh one of the businesses that people just love to buy all the time it always trades at a premium well look at this has... their compound annual growth rate for costco's free cash flow is over 10 percent, which is Pretty impressive, in my opinion. CVS is 3.14. So this is part of the explanation, in my opinion, as to the multiple discrepancy here. Not sure if you agree. Yeah, yeah, of course. But um, what I was just trying to say is that retailers typically have very thin margins. And Costco being one of the best retailers in the world still has a very thin margin, which is, you know, it's fine. It's still generating a ton of cash flow, but it's just the nature of the industry. Yep. Here's like a nice graph of CVS's margins here. And we could also bring up Costco, but... Yeah, so a lot more to look at here, right? So I think the homework for investors who are watching is, I know CVS has been doing some acquisitions. They also have a very interesting space in the pharmaceutical industry and have always been trying to really crack at being one of the number one uh, US, I'd say like healthcare providers, now working with doctors and stuff like that. So I would definitely take a deep look at their business, see what their plans are there. Yeah, another- it, It's cheap, but- are another, they thing, another thing is sectors, tend to go in and out of favor with investors and investors 
like, okay, let me back up a little bit. What drives stock prices in the short term is market sentiment and people's emotions. So it's basically human, human psychology that drives stock prices in the short term. So whenever there is like an, an industry that's being hyped up, currently, I believe that's AI and semiconductors and anything really to do with AI, then people's attention and focus goes over to that industry. It's like, so their money goes over there. And then right now, what are people not looking at? What is not exciting? It could be retailers. It could be like Walgreens, CVS. Um, personally, I would even say like banks are in there right now. Definitely no one's looking at China. No one wants to own commercial real estate. So money has flowed out of these areas, in my opinion. And even utilities. I think even utilities are being hit right now. Kind of like the boring stocks are out of favor right now because there's so much excitement over here which can create discounts. So maybe it could just be that, you know, Walgreens and CVS and these types of stocks are trading cheap because they're just not exciting. There's more excitement elsewhere. And I've been seeing that with some stocks that I love too. I'm not, we're not going to take a deep dive on it now because we've done this in past videos, but the public storage REIT NSA. Yep. I've been dollar cost average buying that stock every single week. Not advice, don't follow my trades, but that to me is a perfect example of what you're saying. People are not really paying attention to it. REITs in general kind of have a bad name. This might actually be a really good segue into another topic we wanted to cover here because many of our viewers know, Daniel, you love banks, specifically Canadian banks. You also seem to be very good at analyzing them. So one of these things is not like the other. EQB, this is your time <laughs> to plug Canada and say something great <laughs> about Canada. But it seems that, yeah, like the banking sector, we have a lot of people, especially uh, Sophie in our Discord requesting, can you please talk about Canadian yep. bank stocks? What's going on there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um i like talking about banks yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's go i wish we had bro here the guy who always says bro in the chat uh should we do <laughs> should we do a quick quick bro no nah, i'm good oh too late Sorry. <laughs> okay if, you, if, if you're gonna make me good. <laughs> all right so i'll share my screen very briefly here actually yes i'll share my screen really quick and then i will stop sharing it and then i will share it again we'll do a little wow. The share, share a thought over here. What am I doing? Sorry, everyone. I need to figure out how to use technology again. All right. <laughs> so this is a bad screenshot quality wise, but we're going to work with it. This is the let, total. Let me bank... help you with these the next stream. We'll make these really crisp. All right. Total bank employee growth since Q4 fiscal 2020. So the end of 2020. This is BMO, Bank of Nova Scotia, um, CM, NA, RY, and TD. Unfortunately, EQ Bank is not in this, but this is the major Canadian banks. Okay. So you can see that basically all the banks besides BNS have been growing their employee count massively. And it almost looks like tech, you know, where they grew employees huge. But now what happened, what was the theme in the most recent bank earnings up here in Canada was like, our expenses are getting out of control. Revenue is up to an all time highs on across the sector, basically with higher interest rates. But now they are just, spending way too much money it seems like so i think margins have compressed quite a bit royal bank of canada the largest bank in canada basically said that now over the next few quarters and for the rest of the year they're going to be focusing on getting their efficiency back because net income was down i think it was like eight to ten percent or something year over year so you know the, the stocks all dropped after their earnings rightfully so in my opinion you know net income declined so PE ratios in that situation would then go up. So I, I agree with the market. I think, you know, they're, 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 their performance in these earnings were not amazing. And I think they got work to do. And that, but if you I, believe, sorry, but if you believe in the long term of the business and that they can write the ships, which I personally believe they can, then in my opinion, it looks like it could be a decent time to get some really good quality companies while they're selling cheap or at least down. <laughs> Yeah, for those of you who are listening on video, we just had a graph up. It basically, like Daniel said, showed the employee count. That was eye-opening to me. I know that U.S. tech stocks went on a hiring spree. Yep. And I didn't really even think to look at other sectors to see if that happened there, too. It's actually surprising to me to see. It seems like banks had very similar behavior with hiring. Yep, it was a little bit eye-opening. Uh, like, in uh, Royal Bank of Canada's report, they said, you know, their employee count or their employee expenses were up 15% year over year. And then they were like, yeah, that's too much. Like we overhired and we got to fix this. So 
there might be some layoffs in the financial sector here pretty soon too while these companies are now focusing on getting their efficiency back yeah one metric i've seen people talk about and it's really interesting to me because i think it's coming along with the times is if numbers of employee uh and then your revenue so basically you take your revenue you divide the number of employees and you got a figure that says this company creates x dollars top line per employee and i think the reason yeah. why this is coming up more is in the age of ai things are getting automated more efficient a uh, team of 100 engineers can now get what a team of 150 engineers could have gotten done a year ago and people are looking at this metric more and more i i think it's pretty important now that i think about it right because at the end of the day businesses are just humans running around working together creating you know market capital gdp and it's a metric i want to start looking at a little bit more i don't think that employee numbers are a part of gap reported financials but it would be really cool if they added that in i would love to see employee count trend on the actual financial statements i know there's other ways to source yes. that data it's definitely not a gap metric but it is a good metric to pay attention to and what's interesting is equitable bank reports this metric every single quarter they make sure to report it freaking eqb equitable bank <laughs> and then what they also do is they they report it once in a while versus the competition in the sector like the big banks and they're like we're kicking you know we're 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 whooping their butts basically <laughs> <laughs> definitely so, so I um oh, i guess this is not really the best chart here never mind yeah you're yanking it i, I was gonna say we're getting a lot of uh comments here in the chat I'm not sure if you wanted to All right. sift, sift through them i found a so good thank you to the uh, 67 people who are tuning in with us live if you're listening to the recording come I hang out with us live sometime on youtube sorry jake no, you're good. All right. So these top three lines here, just to summarize everything. We got Royal Bank of Canada, TD Bank, BMO, and EQB right here. And you can see that Royal Bank of Canada, TD Bank, and BMO's net income are all currently going down, which again is why I think the weakness in the stock prices right now is justified. So these are the large banks, you know, largest banks. Now let's remove all these. And if we take a look at Equitable Bank, in their most recent quarter, their most recent quarter was a record quarter. They had that little bit of weakness right here. This was actually due to an acquisition. So they're, they had some acquisition one-time costs that are now being worked through. And you can see that now that these acquisition costs are going away, the company is actually producing a record amount of net income while the other banks are all seeing a decline. So Equitable Bank is, in my opinion, an outlier in the sector right now. Well, it is a... It's no secret that you are very bullish on Equitable Bank. I also think that yeah. you do own that security. I do not. But I do. yeah, it seems like they had a great quarter. And <laughs> as you mentioned, seems to be separating themselves from other banks based on how they're managing capital. I know in the past streams, you also talked about their loans portfolio and the exposure they had to some more risky loan assets that people are generally nervous about in the banking sector. It doesn't seem that EQB is falling into that trend as well. So I'm cheering you on from the sidelines there. Seems to be a good long-term hold, staple point in your portfolio. Is is that the largest uh, bank holding? I don't know if you want to open up about that, because I think you own a few. Yeah, no, I've, I've said that. It's it's by far my largest bank holding. I own, I think it, I think we said it was six banks now, and it's by far the largest. It's a, it's a decent portion. <laughs> I'll put it at that. All yeah, right, no. but let's, uh, I, I would like to answer some questions here. Um. Money with Kazim says, Daniel, I'm in Calgary too. What's up? The weather is beautiful today. We don't have any smoke finally. So I'm going to, I'm going to be outside today. Finally. All right. Um, <laughs> I don't know, man. No wildfires down here in New York. Oh, we we do have bro here. Day trading. Yo, I'm here, bro. What's up? I, bro? I was going to mention the, the <laughs> second after you said that day trading came in. We, we appreciate you hanging out every week, bro. Knockabout says, I'm in Calgary Monday and Tuesday on a bus. Nice. So Jake is actually coming to Calgary for the Calgary Stampede in July. And we might be trying to plan a July meetup, which I guess we should get on. That's like about a month away at this point. Dude, that's, but, that's in your wheelhouse. You're the party planner there. Yeah, let us know. Let us know if uh, you're in Calgary. And what's the, what's the name of that festival we're going to? The Calgary Stampede. The Calgary Stampede, yes. yes. So this is going to be my first time in Canada and just... To button up what Daniel's saying here, stock unlock meetup in Calgary, somewhere at the Stampede. Let us know if you're interested in hanging out. We're trying to get to meet some of you. 
Uh, Daniel, I have not talked to you about this, but I'm just going to say it. I think for people that confirm that they're coming, it might be cool to get some stock and lock swag, some t-shirts, things like that for people that I come. Actually, I actually don't think they'll come in time. You don't. Takes, All right. Well, never mind. Get your, own dang, get your own dang shirt. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. It's, wow. swag, uh, it's, swag is hard. It takes a long time to get it. LTD. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, continue. Daniel Workman says, my human psychology, I am impatient, so I invest in blue chip dip in stocks like TD, so I get paid to wait in dollar cost average. Yeah. So I'm actually reading The Snowball right now, which is uh, the, the book about Warren Buffett's entire life. It's an incredible read. By the way, definitely would recommend that book. Um, what was I going to say? Sorry. Oh, in the book, he was preaching at one point that impatience is the enemy of the investor. And you should basically be patient all the time and try to make sure that you're buying stocks at reasonable valuations. Because like, if you get excited, like right now in the AI sector, right? Ex as an example, if you're getting excited and you're like, oh, well, the stocks are currently going up. I love the business, but, you know, it's trading at a 100 price to free cash flow, but it's going up right now. So I'm just going to buy it anyways. Um, Buffett basically was saying that that is the enemy of the investor. That emotion towards buying stocks is really bad for long term returns. So uh, definitely try to try to figure out a way to do that or work against that. And dollar cost averaging, I believe, is a good way. I actually have this problem too. Last year, I don't know if I've ever told anyone this, but last year in 20, no, sorry, in 2021, when Google reported its quarter where it was like 60% revenue growth, 60% free cash flow growth, it was trading at $3,000 a share. And after I was trading, I bought some of it. And I was like, how do you oh, feel? I mean, how do you feel about that today? Bad because it brought up my <laughs> average. And, and I was like, in hindsight, it was just such an emotional thing to do because I love Google and, you know, it had a great quarter, but I wasn't focusing on like, okay, well, what is the business selling for right now? And do I think that it's actually realistically going to grow revenue again at 60% over the next year? The answer was no, but I read the report and I was like, I need to buy this stock right now. It's such a great business. So I went out and bought some and it like brought up my average so much. And I was just like, now, now I'm dealing with that still today. <laughs> so I'd say the good thing is, is now in the future, and I'm going to quote you, actually, nothing's a mistake uh, unless if you don't like get a lesson from it. So as long as you're learning from these things and I've made the same, not the exact same mistake, but similar mistakes. Two, two things to help out. One, self catch yourself, understand when that mindset comes on. And whenever you feel emotional to buy or sell a stock, my rule is don't let yourself buy or sell it. The second thing is, and I had to chant this to myself, it's almost like an affirmation mantra like a meditation thing when you see people tweeting so much about nvidia you just say to yourself there are tens of thousands of stocks in the <laughs> stock market that i can invest in why would i invest in the one or two stocks that are being looked at by every single human and hedge fund in america do i know something they don't probably not and with tools like stock and lock it's really fun to actually go and look at those stocks as you said before that no one else is looking at and surprise surprise that's usually where a lot of the opportunity is when you said, you know, money leaves certain staple stocks, utilities, banks goes to tech, AI. These are usually trends that sway back and forth. And people yep. like Warren Buffett, again, as you say, Daniel, find those opportunities, understand how to value the businesses and then take a long term bet. So that's what yeah, I try to do in these situations. And it helps me at least avoid buying into hype. We, we've all been there. Just learn from your mistakes. Yeah, it's it's actually interesting. Like Warren Buffett throughout his life he owned geico in like the 60s i believe it might have been before the 60s but he made a lot of money on it sold it because he found a better opportunity but he always loved geico because of, he had some like sentiment towards this business because he initially at the beginning of his career made so much money on it so he was constantly tracking the stock for like two decades really wanting to buy back into it and then i believe it was sometime in the early 70s where the company was going through a really hard time. Like, honestly, it could have gone under. And he he even says in the book that it was one of the stocks that he purchased where on Monday it could be a total loss, but he still bought it. And he bought like $4 million worth. Um, Ca but casual. He, <laughs> but yeah, he basically he waited for 20 years to buy that stock again, though, because he just couldn't bring himself to buy it at the high price. It went from $60 down to two, and that's where he bought it. It fell that hard. 
Same thing with American Express. He loved American Express as a business. And then I think it was in the late 60s, he ended up buying American Express because the company had one of its subsidiary com subsidiaries commit fraud. But it was like a small subsidiary, had no impact on the actual business. And what he did is he went out. So American Express was introducing ma or credit cards and everything. So he went out and like him and his buddies went out and they asked American Express customers if they were still using their credit cards and whatever. And overwhelmingly, everyone was like, yeah, like the average American Express customer didn't even know that there was anything going on with its subsidiary. And they were all still happy with the business. So while the stock was down, I believe that this was also the time of the 1974 stock market crash. So it was like a double whammy against American Express. But he was waiting and he freaking bought it. He bought a lot of it. It was the fastest he ever deployed capital in his lifetime. And I think he put up to 40% of his partnership's capital in American Express at that time. And he just like plowed money into it as fast as he could. And he still owns it today. They still have that stock. And they're up like 20, they're up like 20x on it, if not more. And there you go, dude. That's the Munker move. Uh, Diversification, as he likes to say. But yeah, when you see a good deal and you feel confident, you have high conviction. No, no harm, no foul there. Yeah, dude, that book is incredible, honestly. Like, I'm learning so much about Buffett's life, man. This guy's crazy. I think I think I'm gonna have to read that one too. Anyways, I do see a really great comment here from Kai. Thank you for this one. What is a reasonable price to free cash flow for a profitable and growing company such as CRWD? So I will take this very briefly because Daniel, I think you are probably best suited to answer this. I don't know about CRWD in particular, but price to free cash flow, a good way to find an acceptable price to free cash flow is actually looking at other stocks in the sector and analyzing what those have traded at historically. So this is going to differ for tech stocks, bank stocks, automobile stocks, things like that. So look at their competitors, see what they're trading for. You also want to look at their growth. So a lot of investors pay for growth. So if they're making X free cash flow today, but you think that they realistically can 3X that in the future, that is going to have an influence over the price to free cash flow you might be comfortable paying for. For example, you buy a stock today, it's a 20 price of free cash flow. If the free cash flow doubles next year, your free cash flow on cost is actually 10 relative to the time when you bought it. So that is how a lot of value-based investors think about this. Daniel, not sure if you have more to add there if you're familiar with CRWD in particular. No, I agree with you. In terms of like what I would pay, let me actually just go take a look at it quick. Because this is a cybersecurity company, I believe. And these companies we're trading quite expensive in my opinion. So I'm just going to go take a look at what it's trading at now. I do agree with you. It's, a, it's always a good idea to take a look at, you know, um, PE price to free cash flow, price to operating cash flow versus the company's history to see what it's trading at today versus its history relative to its history. This is actually exactly what Benjamin Graham did and preached by the way. And he was, he was happy to buy stocks where if, they, if their historical average was a 15 PE and they're trading for like 10, he would like to buy them because then they're obviously trading at a discount to his, his history. But it also get into dangerous situations doing that because if a stock has always been expensive or if it IPO'd in the last three years during a bull market and it was trading for super expensive, you know, let's say like a price to free cash flow of 60 and then now it's trading for 30. Yes, it's trading for a discount to its averages and its history, but is it still cheap today? I don't know. CrowdStrike. All right, let's take a look. This company. Is it my... worth, worth a screen share here? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to share my screen. Cool. I was working on that. So CrowdStrike, this is exactly what happened, by the way. They IPO'd, um, looks like sometime in 2020. And you can see here that they were trading for a price to free cash flow of 200, which is what NVIDIA is trading for now. And it's, it's steadily been coming down. So yeah, the company's price to free cash flow is below its average of 114, but it's still 53, which is still pretty freaking high. Um, so what, what does this company do again? They're a cybersecurity company. Interesting. Okay. So yeah, they're growing their cash flow. I mean, at 50% per year, cash flow is at an all time high. So, I mean, they are growing quick, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. This still looks kind of expensive to me. I don't, I also just don't know if they can continue this growth rate. Like theoretically, 
if they could grow their cash flow at 56% per year over the next five years, then a 50 PE or 50 price to free cash flow today would probably be a steal. But as an individual, I have no idea if they can do that. Genuinely no idea. So it that's where the risk comes in. Basically, when you're buying a stock at a high multiple, you're buying a lot of future growth. And if that growth doesn't materialize, then you're most likely going to end up losing money. So the higher the multiple, the more future growth you're buying and the more you're relying on the future to be great for that business. Yep. And, and sometimes, sometimes that actually works. So to be fair to all different types of investors, Daniel, I think you and I retroactively would have and probably do look silly for Tesla stock. Because if you did a financial analysis on that stock, looked at the multiples, especially a couple of years ago, just on paper, the thought from a value investor is, holy crap, these multiples are insane. There's no meat on the bone here for me to make money. That obviously was not true with Tesla stock. So in the case of CrowdStrike and like you're saying any others, if someone is a savvy investor and you do really see the future and you are that convinced that their free cash flow will monstrously grow that much, you shouldn't be afraid of a 50 price to free cash flow. But again, that has to come back to your investment thesis and confidence on the future growth. Because Daniel, as you're saying, it's just basically saying investors are starting to price that in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, great, um, great question here, Kai. Yeah, in terms of valuing businesses, though, I, I read a quote from Munger the other day that I 100% resonate with. And he basically was like, I don't have a formula. I can't give you one. And it comes down to just like gathering as much information as you can on a business and then looking at the price of it today. And then in your, in your brain, in your gut and using your intuition, you should be like, okay, this is expensive or it's not. And it's not like if it's trading at an 18 price to free cash flow, it's cheap. If it's trading at 19 or it's expensive. It's just like you get a general feel over time as an investor where you put all of the facts together and you can come to a conclusion in your brain where it's like it hits you over the head if it's cheap or not. And he says that it should hit you over the head where you he he says you shouldn't even have to use a discounted cash flow calculator. It should just hit you over the head that hard when something is cheap and when you want to buy it. I agree 100 percent. And outside of the scope of financial analysis, I am becoming more and more passionate. I always have been, but increasingly so lately on investing based on the management is it a founder-led business? So whenever I found businesses that are founder-led, ding, ding, Airbnb, Brian Chesky, what up? I love you. I love investing in those businesses. And at the end of the day, these are a bunch of humans running around making money, right? It's not magic. They're, these are people going to work every single day building something. So when you get great leadership, such as Elon, Brian Chesky, all these people, that is a very big factor in the investment decision for me as well. So sometimes the multiples, in my opinion, are a part of the story, but you have to look at management. Also, what industry is this in? Do they have a moat? All that other stuff we like to talk about. But there's yeah, always, so yeah. funny, funny comment here. Um, about seven minutes ago, Rob said 30 minutes in and Jake hasn't mentioned air dot, 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 dot. <laughs> so I said, lol, Rob. And then at 43 minutes, you mentioned it. So Rob, there it is. We went 43 <laughs> minutes, new record. <laughs> well, Daniel, I have you beat because it only took you around 12 minutes to mention EQB. So yeah, but to be fair, we're talking about Canadian bank stocks. <laughs> I'll, I'll try. I'll try and go 20 minutes next time. <laughs> I, I feel like we have to have like a little counter now on like the bottom right corner of the stream of a record, but. Well, Fair I would enough, said there Fair should enough. be a drinking game every time Daniel says equitable bank and Jenk says this is not financial advice. <laughs> oh, God, that would be dangerous. Hopefully you're playing with water because if you were, were playing with adult beverages, I think that would get a little not financial advice crazy. So take a drink for that one. <laughs> All right. Um, Rob also says, Daniel, if you had regret about buying that Google buy, you could have sold it the next day or two. I didn't regret this for a while. That's the problem. Oh, how long did I, it take? That's an interesting thought. It took until the stock went down like 30 something percent. And then I, in hindsight, I was like, like, this is the time to be buying Google here. And if I had that cash, 
where, you know, I was buying Google literally at the all time high, the highest the stock has ever been is where I bought it. Well, like I had shares, but I added to my position there. So if I had that cash, when Google was trading for like a 17 price to free cash flow, you know, like that was my thought is just like, you know, this is the time to be buying. I should not have been buying when everyone was so excited Buy when like people are bearish. People right. thought that Google was going to, you know, I don't, I don't know the exact words, but the sentiment against Google at one point in the past year was awful. And that was the time to be buying it. So I'm going to pick on you a little bit here. You said something. You said you didn't feel bad about it at first. And then like retroactively after stock movement, you then felt bad. But if the stock went up, would we be here saying, even though they grew 60%, I recognized that this was an opportunity not to be missed. And I'm happy I bought it then since the share price went up. I mean, that's a good question, but I would hope that I would still think that was a mistake. Because you would look at the multiples now, right? Because if the stock did only go up, then their price to free cash flow or the valuation metrics we like to use would probably be, I don't want to say double, but higher than they are now. Yes. And anyways, to make you feel a little jealous, Daniel, to learn from your friend, I was patient. My average on Google is around 90. I piled up, piled up on Amazon when I was down there, Microsoft average price around like 220-ish. So not trying to rub it in, but if you want to feel patient, Talk to your friend, Jake. I just won't tell you to buy Canadian bank stocks, though. So, <laughs> Worst financial advisor ever. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you for letting me pick on you a bit there. And yes, if um, you are new, we've gotten interesting comments in the past about Daniel and I picking on each other. This is all friendly. Please don't worry. We are Nathan, both safe. <laughs> yeah, safe space. Safe space. <laughs> safe, safe bubble here. Not like NVIDIA bubble. No, no, oh. <laughs> Okay, we got a question. Daniel, any dip buying on TDE this week after results? So I am not buying stocks right now, unfortunately, not because like I don't want to be, I would love to be, but I can't be because I've had uh, life expenses come up that have caused me to not be able to buy stocks. So no, I have not bought any TD. I've not bought any anything really. Basically, at this moment, if I'm buying a stock, it's because I'm selling a stock and then I have cash. To buy another one but um no i'm not buying td right now or anything really if anyone wants to support daniel and his uh, stock buying habits which i want to you can go to stock unlock share it with your friends get other people to buy our stuff it's actually worth it we charge a fair price and that is going to help you get back on the winning ship there of having the cash flows to invest so thank you everyone who is who is already a subscriber i think we have a lot of you in here uh, i'm going to take a quick question here daniel from Alex Pohl, wait, Jake buys something besides Airbnb? Yes. Yeah, he likes to buy crypto and uh, oh, whoa, whoa. and micro cap <laughs> stocks that have no cash on their balance sheet. Just really likes to wing it. That is a lie. Uh, <laughs> I have never bought crypto. I actually got $15 of free Bitcoin from the Coinbase Super Bowl commercial, which was free. The stock I've been buying lately is I've been buying like one or two shares of Airbnb a week since they dropped on earnings. I like the price they're trading at now. It's getting close to 6% free cash flow yield. NSA, I brought this up a few times, public storage REIT. That is something I've been buying for my IRA account for long-term hold. In my opinion, not advice, I really like that stock right now. I love its dividend yield. I love its growth prospect. I view it as a growth dividend play. I think it's being ignored by the larger market and I love the management. I love how they've been running that business. I think it's trading at a discount to its peers because there's a few other uh, public storage REIT stocks out there. So I encourage people to look into it and give me their honest feedback. We looked into it in the past stream as well, but I have actually been buying that stock the most. Just keep in mind, very slow dollar cost averaging, boring investing. Um. You're, I believe that this was about CrowdStrike. It says all that free cash flow is also stock-based compensation. Important to look at that as well. So a little bit of a teaser. We just got stock-based compensation. It is not on stock on a lock yet, but we officially have the data. We are paying for it. So I think, Jake, you might be working a little bit this weekend to add it in. I, I looked at it this morning just like to make sure that the data was good. So far, the data looks good. So we seem to have stock-based compensation. It should be coming to stock unlock soon. And with this data, we can do a lot of stuff, all right? We can, we can basically show you 
we can create a brand new metric that's like, what is the stock based compensation as a percent of revenue, free cash flow, operating cash flow, and then basically report that back so that you can see, okay, well, you know, this company has 50% of its revenue is free cash flow, probably not the best. So we can really do whatever we want. What the hell just happened? I think a car is dying outside. But yeah, we can we can do a lot of stuff with the stock based compensation. If you guys have any ideas, let us know. Um, we're probably going to create some stock unlock insights with that data as well and start grading companies based on their stock based compensation. And uh, yeah, so exciting times. Yeah, we have had hundreds of requests for this. The reality is financial data is expensive. Many of you know we partner with a financial data provider. We went through a lot of effort and due diligence to find someone that provides accurate data. We have been working for a year and a half on this. So if you have been patiently waiting and hearing me say over and over again, it's coming, really appreciate your patience there. I can promise you, Daniel and I, including Nick, who is the third co-founder who is not here, we are always tirelessly working around the clock to improve the stock unlock experience for you. As a user myself, Daniel, because we pay for this, by the way, like I pay the monthly fee every month for yep. Stock Unlock. So does Daniel. We're customers as well. I am going to throw a party when we have stock-based compensation. Oh I have God. I on my wait. body right now due to how excited I am about this. So coming very soon to the best stock analysis platform near you. Fire stuff. Yeah, I, I cannot wait. <laughs> um, rapid fire question time. Daniel, are you still bullish on cargo jet? Adding, as I just said, I'm not adding stocks right now due to life events, but uh, I am still bullish. Definitely still bullish, still have my position. And I like it. I think it's a good business. Founder led trading for an adjusted price to free cash flow of about 10 today. So not that expensive in my opinion and should continue to grow over the long term. I'd love insight on how to find companies that will turn or trending towards turning profitable, have positive cash flows. I actually don't have anything really to say here. I think that we're, I think that involves a lot of like reading through the 10 Qs and 10 Ks and trying to figure out like what is this company's plan to get back to profitability and trying to understand like the business's strategy. I'm, I actually, Daniel, I do think Stock and Lock would help for this. So in our insight screener, we have the growth and profitability scores. Yes. So what I would try to do to find some of these stocks is if you look up a high growth score, that means averaged out across its income statement. Uh, values in the trailing 12 months, it's growing, it's revenues, gross profit, things like that. I'd look for above four. And then if you do a lower profitability score, that's actually going to give you companies that are not that profitable yet. So you can try to find, and I agree with you, there's no more research to do after the screener, but stocks that are growing that are not yet profitable. And if Stock Auto is here, I'm not sure if you're still in the chat, let us know Stock Auto. I am sure that you will be vibrating <laughs> with happiness in your chair thinking about that, because I think that is his investment strategy. Find companies yeah. that are growing, not profitable yet, that are going to flip it and get in, as he said, very politely to us a couple years before you and I would join in. So that's how I would do that. Stock and lock screener. Check it out. Yeah, good point, actually. Um, Knockabout says, Bruce Flat says, look where others aren't. Big fan of retail real estate. Time is a BN competitive advantage. Yeah, so I guess we went 53 minutes without talking about Brookfield. So here it comes. Bam. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so in their, in their most recent conference call, Brookfield said, they're actually raising money in their real estate fund right now and they're value investors at heart. The company is a value investing company. So while everyone is bearish on real estate, especially commercial real estate, I wouldn't be surprised to see Brookfield buy some more commercial real estate, high quality commercial real estate and get it for cheap. That's what they do. So where, where everyone else isn't looking tends to be where they look. And uh, I agree. All right. Uh, another question while we're on the topic of BAM and Brookfield. Hey, Daniel, first time live here. Welcome to the stream. I watch all your videos. Thank you. Love that. Um, is BN or BAM a bigger position in your portfolio? They're pretty equal. I have them in multiple accounts. Like, for example, I have BAM in my TFSA and my RRSP so that I can get the, the tax-free dividend. So it's split up. I haven't actually added them all up recently, but I believe they're about equal. Right now, if I were looking to buy one, it would be BN. I think BN is cheaper than BAM right now. Also, Bruce Flatt, who is the CEO of Brookfield, uh, recently sold $60 million worth of BAM 
and then immediately bought $60 million worth of BN. So it looks like he's trimming BAM to buy BN. And I agree with him. I think BN's cheaper. So that's my opinion. It just doesn't pay as much of a dividend. Fair um, enough. We have a good question down here I'll take. We are one. Hi, sorry to join late. Please don't be sorry. It's great to have you with us. I was just curious. What's the difference between Google G-O-O-G-L ticker and Goog G-O-O-G? And which is the better choice? I'm blind, so probably won't be able to follow the live chat. Well, we will give this answer verbally to you. Thank you for the heads up there. The share uh, difference between GOOGL and GOOG is based on voting rights. And for the common shareholder, uh, not financial advice, consult the professional, but at least for me, doesn't really matter too much. I'm not owning enough shares where I think my votes are going to have much impact on what they do on the board. For me, I personally buy uh, the cheaper option, the B-class shares. But I would not say one is better than the other. I think they tend to trade pretty similarly. So that's my take. It's not as important as it seems. I'd say for most retailers, the cheaper share option sometimes makes it a little bit more accessible. But now that most brokerages offer fractional share buying, it's become a little more opaque to me. Not sure if you have anything to add there, Daniel. Uh, no, I, I agree with everything. Which one do you own? Do you go for the A-class or B-class shares? I own the Canadian exchange one. So I actually buy ah. it in Canadian dollars, which is, I, I actually don't know which one it tracks. It's like an ADR then? Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. It's just that I don't have to convert currency, which is nice. Um, You guys did a great job with the data provider better than BMO data I have. Yeah, so we really shopped around for data to put into stock and lock. It's really important to have high quality data. We do our best to have the best data. It's not perfect by any means. I don't think that you can ever really get perfect data. But if you ever notice anything, let us know. We report it. And then usually within 24 hours, it's fixed. But it's been pretty decent. A lot of the time, whenever someone's like, oh, there's two different, there's two different data pieces here like revenue is different on yahoo finance versus stock unlock then we go the source of truth is always the company's financial report and whenever we go and take a look at the financial report like 99 percent of the times we're right and yahoo finance will be wrong so yeah we're pretty happy with it um definitely have some kinks to work out though and uh, let us know if you find any bugs yeah and that's definitely like one of the reasons why we built this as well i'm actually going to bring up a quick screenshot daniel because we had a really great compliment from a user i don't worry this is anonymized for our data quality yeah it's it's really interesting to me one term i like to use that people have not heard is the financial data cartel of bloomberg s p refinitiv that has been getting broken up recently which is why companies like stock and lock were able to leverage more friendly companies like finhub who saw very accurate data to get that and what we're looking at here Emails cut off, but I'm a commercial banking analyst for TD for over a year now, as well as a passionate investor for four to five years. Trust me, I've learned the importance of completing uh, thorough due diligence. This person was extremely impressed at the accuracy of our financial data and actually was not using Yahoo Finance or other sites because of how wrong it was. So this person reached out to us and just asked, hey, where are you getting this from? We had a really great exchange, and this is just really great social proof. As a founder of Stock Unlock, this is stuff that brings a smile to my face, and this person is considering a subscription. So we are finally starting to get noticed by professionals. And to be honest, Daniel, we've done a pretty poor job at uh, growing our business outside of our networks, which is something we're really focusing on this year. So tell your friends. If you have people who are into investing and they're not on, on Stock Unlock yet, spread the word. We're trying to grow. Yeah, definitely. Um Oh, okay. Day Trading says, how did you guys meet and start the business? Maybe you can explain this quick, Jake. <laughs> I'm going to explain this very quickly because I recommend day trading. Please go and watch episode number one of Stop Talk. You can find that on our YouTube or on our podcast. If you're looking for the full story of how this company started, which I actually think is really interesting, but you know, it's also coming from someone who was a part of the story. <laughs> uh, I would watch episode one. I'd say the quick prelude is... I was watching Daniel's videos and a bunch of other YouTubers during the pandemic. I started noticing they were balancing a lot of different subpar subscriptions to multiple third-party data applications for investing. 
And Daniel would create these Excel sheets in his videos. And he said that he would spend five to eight hours a week creating these Excel sheets. So me being an engineer, I had a, another job at the time. I just thought, hey, I could probably write a program to generate this for him. He could generate these in seconds, not spend five to eight hours a week. And I formed this complex in my mind that Daniel, this random person on the internet who doesn't know me, couldn't ignore me because he's smart enough to know that I would be saving his time. Where I'll kind of put a bookmark in the story for you to go back to episode one is there is a multi-month charade of borderline harassing Daniel online across many social channels and constantly improving the platform. Needless to say, it was not love at first sight, but obviously a lot of determination, coding, and entrepreneurship on both of our fronts, as well as Nick, who's not here, has led to what is Stock Unlocked today. We have thousands of global paying users. We are growing, and there is no end in sight. So if you want to get that full story again, episode number one on Spotify or YouTube, it would take a little bit longer to go through the whole thing. So hopefully that wasn't too long, but a nice little sneak peek. Yeah. Fun times. <laughs> <laughs> was it was it fun times, Daniel? It's like, oh, oh my God, it's over. I don't have to deal. I think I, I got you on Instagram, multiple emails, your YouTube. Yeah, it was it was a hard vibe. Dude, you were in my inbox like weekly. It'd be like, oh, there, there's Jake Ruth's weekly email that I'm not going to respond to. Who is this guy? And then eventually I responded. I was like, you know, just out of respect for the hustle, because you were you were sending like novels to me with the update of what you were building and you're like dude i think you got to get in on this like come on man it's gonna save you time so after like the 20th email or whatever it was i was like just out of respect for this guy's hustle i'm just gonna like start responding and then here we are to get him um, off my back <laughs> alex says who is nick why is he the silent partner so nick was actually on one of our live streams um yeah yeah i think it was like number eight nine or 10 or 11 so something around there yeah nick is nick is like a behind the scenes guy he's a very strong technical engineer has actually done a lot of the coding behind stock unlock but yeah you know we do these live streams on saturday morning i think he likes to enjoy his weekends so he doesn't he doesn't really doesn't really come on the live streams very often but he has before so if you want to go see nick he was on one of the live streams yeah, not, not everyone loves being on camera and things like that. So yeah. I think it just comes down to personality mixed up. I'd say our founding team has a great array of varying and balancing personalities. You might be kind of putting that together yourself, just watching Daniel, Daniel and I weekly on these. But yeah, shout out to Nick. Uh, he's usually watching these. So hello. You are missed and happy Saturday. He's actually at his friend's wedding today. So let's send oh, yeah. them all a congratulations. He is down in Missouri. Far Fair away. enough. Um, Fair enough. About says, I see a huge need for financial literacy, creating programs focused on understanding investing markets, business fundamentals, metrics, et cetera, would allow organic growth through, through schools. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that this is a huge part. I think that schools are missing this. And I it makes me sad that when we graduate, we have no idea of how to invest properly, save money, budget. It's a huge problem, in my opinion. And like, if people were taught how to do this, I think the economy would be a lot stronger, but also at the same time, banks would not make as much money. So maybe it's not in banks' best interest for that. But uh, uh, we're, in, terms we're of society, in, in terms of society's best interest, yeah, it's sad that we're not taught about finances. It's really sad. Uh, sounds like you have a background in sales. If that is geared at me, no one has ever told me this in my life. And uh, I think I suck at sales. So thank you. I've been working very hard at it. How did you guys meet Nick? from Rob H. Nick and I actually worked at Oscar Health together before Stock Unlock. So Nick and I were actually coworkers. And interestingly enough, while we didn't know who each other were at our past jobs, we weren't super close until right up till when we were about to leave. I started a channel at work called Stock Gambling, which was meant to be a like Wall Street bets clone just for us to waste time at work because that's what engineers do when you work at big corps. And Nick and I started to really bond over investing as well as Daniel's videos. And I was actually giving Nick the play-by-play -play of me contacting Daniel, maybe getting one answer, not getting one for a couple of weeks. And he he was very involved in both creating and building Stock and Lock, the vision that we're all describing here of providing everyone with investment education tools, financial literacy. So yeah, him and I go, go back. 
but Daniel, what's what's going on here? Ebook. That's a, such a big project, man. I'm working on it. <laughs> I work on my book for probably about 30 minutes a day during the week. It's like a, a stress relieving meditative thing for me. And, but man, it takes a long time. I thought that was going to be done at the end of 2022. No, <laughs> no, I'm on my, I'm on like my fifth read through of the book. And the problem is every time I read through the book, like the, the core material is actually done. I'm just like revising it, reading it, trying to make it perfect. And every time I read through my book, I'm like, it can be better. And then I make improvements to it. So I don't know when that's going to stop. Uh -oh, you're a perfectionist. You caught the bug. Uh, well, yeah. I'm excited for that as well. Um, how much did you guys spend money-wise in terms of building your business? So it was incremental. Daniel, I don't know if you remember this. The first kind of like hook in we got as people who knew each other virtually was we were finally in contact. And I said, hey, there's this financial data API. We're not using them anymore. They ended up not being great. But I think it was like 50 or or $100 a month. And I was like, would you be willing to go like $50, $50 with me on this? Kind of, you know, both proving to each other we got a little bit of skin in the game. I think in total, we each across the three of us pulled around $2,000 together, which covered the cost of incorporating buying stock and lock.com. But we did go through Y Combinator in the winter 2022 batch. Y Combinator is pretty much the world's top accelerator, Airbnb, Uber, a ton of those great companies have went through Y Combinator. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a camp for startups. They give money and mentorship. It's very great. We ended up getting into Y Combinator. So we got a lot of seed round funding and actually went out and raised from investors. So we closed a seed round of funding last summer. We are well capitalized, looking to leverage that money on positive ROI marketing spends, things like that to grow the business. And this is a corporation. We are incorporated in Delaware, US company. It's real. We're growing and we have huge aspirations for this. So really appreciate the curiosity and questions around this. Thanks for that one, bro. Yeah, if, uh, if anyone has any experience and would like to lend their hand or suggestions about how to grow a small company, let us know. We are we are starting to enter the grow more phase and starting to invest more money into trying to grow this business. Now that we've built a really compelling product, we're still going to improve the product. Like as we said, we're going to add in stock-based compensation and whatnot, but the focus is shifting more and more towards growth. So if you have any suggestions for us, let us know. We're definitely approaching that phase. Yeah. Um, um, I was going to say hopefully. a quick shout out to Rob, Rob, Ralph, Ralph Jesus. <laughs> You are not Rob, you are Ralph. Sorry, there was another Rob in here. Ralph, I will actually give you a virtual badge right now. I think that you are one of the most consistent, providing great input, stock and lock fans. Really appreciate all of our email exchanges and the incredible feedback you've given us. Thank you so yeah. much. And for everyone else that has done that, really looking forward to meeting you in Calgary. That's going to be fun. To answer your question here, how close are you for syncing brokerage accounts? Well, I am very, very deep in chats with another business to business company who would provide the brokerage linking functionality. I vetted them from a security standpoint, and we are now doing engineering planning around that. I do not have an exact date for this, but over this summer, we are looking and hoping to add that in. Just no promises here because these things change all the time, but that is our current light guidance, I would say. Definitely check in on that. Talks are happening and we are actively looking into adding that in. I know that is the highest friction pain point right now with portfolios. And we have heard heard all the great feedback from you all. Yeah. Um, Knockabout says, oh, sorry. Knock, Knockabout says, I would license to Equitable Bank or Wealthsimple. So yeah, this is one of the ideas we had is trying to reach out to investing platforms where simply put we believe stock and lock is so much better than the than the atrocities they provide sometimes in certain situations we've been doing this we've been trying to reach out to brokers and basically let them license the stock and lock platform so that they can provide it to their own users who invest on their platforms but it's it's proving to be a challenge to get these companies to respond it's like we literally just want to make your business better I have an idea, Daniel. 
for everyone here, most of you guys invest in stocks. You're on your brokerages. And I'm very serious, by the way. You want to help us out, do this. Please hit up customer support for your brokerage. And in a very kind way, say, <laughs> your, I'm, I'm so serious. Your tools are not providing me the things I need to succeed. Analyze financial statements. Analyze more a portfolio. And you should tell them, I am using Stock Unlock to do this. And I am leaving your website to use this software, which is better than yours. Can you please find a way to build this or partner with this company so I can stay on your website? And that would be incredible for us. That to me, Daniel, is a growth hack. Ground, ground, ground up. Yeah. I think you were going to ask or answer this question, Jake, before I cut you off. Uh, sure. Can we invest in Stock and Lock? Right now, the answer is no. So we raised on Safe Notes, S A F E. You can look those up if you want to know what they are. And we can only raise from credited investors. However, we have gotten a ton of interest from our users and other investors that they would love to get involved. So we are planning and aiming to raise a Series A at the beginning of 2024. I'll be pretty honest right now, our growth rates are ticked a little bit lower than they need to be to hit that milestone. So we are driving towards as hard as we can. And there is a way that we could crowdfund source on here where people can invest probably as low as $500 or $1,000. There's a lot of vehicles that allow you to do this now where you don't have to be a accredited investor. Keep on letting us know if you're interested in that because basically it's going to be input from you guys. If there's enough interest and you guys want to get behind that, we would love to give you all a small piece of the business. I know that creates more super fans. Well, then when you guys are invested, you're going to be more apt to tell your friends and everyone about Stock Unlock. And yeah, uh, the door is open, but no way to do that today. So let us know if you're interested. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, uh, I actually just noticed, Daniel, we are at an hour and 11 minutes right now. I know that you had some plans today. Yep, I do. Um, and I actually just got a call. So for everyone who's still here, we haven't really been talking stocks for that long. So if you're here, you're probably a super fan and we love you. So I'll let you into the life a little bit. This is also a public service announcement for anyone who has cats, okay? So I bought oh, Shelby yeah. flowers for her birthday, which was May 14th. Um, bought her a nice bouquet of flowers, had it sitting in my house. It had lilies in it. Um, my cats rubbed up against the lilies. They got the lily pollen on them. And then I was like, oh, no big deal, whatever, you know, they'll lick it off. They licked it off. And then we found out that lilies are incredibly poisonous to cats and can actually kill them. It has a very high rate of kidney failure if if cats even like lick lily pollen off of themselves. So we rushed the cats to the emergency. They're actually currently in the hospital and uh, they're on an IV to help get the poison out of their systems. So if you have cats, do not buy lilies and they're going to be in the hospital till tomorrow evening, hoping everything goes well. Yeah, so yeah, that's what's going on. That's people like, in the chat could say, yeah, like just a little either prayer, mantra, uh, whatever <laughs> you believe or don't believe in. Send positive energy to Daniel's cats. I have been doing that as well. Yeah, I'm going to go see them today. I actually, I just got a call. I missed it from the hospital. So, All right, man. Well, let's get you to that. I mean, life calls, right? While these live streams are fun, uh, the lives of your family are incredibly important. And yes, that includes cats. Thank you, everyone, Definitely for joining us. family. Of course, yeah. of course. Yeah, that will... That's why I was pitching Chewy stock, which is still <laughs> too expensive for me to buy, but it's on my watch list. I don't like to do technical analysis, but it's anyways, <laughs> so hard to not just endlessly talk about stocks. Daniel, I hope that you have a beautiful weekend. I hope everyone in the chat has a great weekend as well. If you have cats, like Daniel said, keep them away from the lilies. And we're going to see you all next week. Thank you for yeah, coming. Thanks. thanks everyone for the kind words. I'm hopeful, you know. One thing, as I said, that I learned in Asia was don't worry until you have to. Right now, they're doing fine. So I'm not going to worry about it because if I worry right now and then, you know, Sunday rolls along and nothing happens, then all of that worrying was for nothing. So I'm not going to worry until something bad happens. Yeah. What, what do they say? Worry never walk the dog. But I guess in this case, worry never walk the cat. When you worry, you suffer twice. There's no point in doing it until you have to. So. Just not going to let it happen. Well, geez, investor turned philosopher, <laughs> Daniel Pronk. <laughs> all right. I, all right. I got my finger on the end <laughs> broadcast. Have a great, great weekend, everybody. Take it easy. See you, everyone.